Yo, my peoples, what's up? My name is Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining me for another Dice Tower Review. Today, I'm taking a look at Resident Evil 3, the board game. Uh, this one is from Steamforge Game. It is the follow-up to Resident Evil 2, the board game. <laughs> Uh, based on the popular video game franchise, and from what I understand, uh, it is based closely on the Resident Evil 3 video game. Uh, a lot of same stuff happens. It is a survival horror game for one to four players, in which players are playing humans in a post-apocalypse wasteland, fighting their way through zombies, and eventually coming to a big baddie. Uh, lots of similarities to a uh, dungeon crawl genre with minis and tiles and all that kind of thing, but some very specific differences to make it survival horror. I am very eager to show you how it works in the table, then I'll tell you what I think. So without further ado, let's go to the videotape. All right, so let's get started by taking a look at the character. So that is Carlos there. Uh, there are one of four choices. So in a four-player game, you're playing all of them. Uh, and veterans of the video game will recognize uh, your character, your health tracker, not a lot. <laughs> uh, the guns and equipment, and of course the snazzy uh, dial for the ammo, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, the big thing I wanted to focus on, uh, it really tells a lot about this game and this one little component right here, the die. Uh, this is a successful hit, and there are no other successful hits on this die. Uh, you'll be able to push monsters. I'll show you that in a minute. You'll be able to dodge monsters for the most part, but one lonely hit, one out of six chance. So that just tells you right away so much of the mission statement of this game, which is survival. You're not going to go in here and blow a lot of uh, creatures away. Uh, don't expect that. You will, fear not, get upgraded uh, items, shotgun and grenade launcher with the uh, requisite dials right there. However, you're not rolling that much more dice <laughs> and the dice don't get that much better. So uh, it is a survival game through and through. Do not expect to just go in and mow. Uh, use the environment. Says a lot. In terms of the enemies that you'll face, a lot of zombies. <laughs> and look at that, the zombie dog, which is a little bit faster. Uh, and then you get up to the nemesis uh, right there. There's not a, not a lot of variety uh, in the monsters. I mean, they're zombies. <laughs> uh, how much do you want? In terms of the play on the board, uh, at this point, I want to uh, emphasize that this is the retail version. Kickstarter version had uh, improved components for doors. Uh, and some other things. So it's a little bit hard to see here on this overview, uh, but this is what you're getting with the retail version. This is what I have to review. All right, so uh, you have four actions on a turn. You are gonna move one space, uh, and you can also shoot. So shooting right there, that would be a big fat miss. <laughs> uh, you can load up, so you're gonna have a certain amount of ammo, uh, and you can reload, uh, find new ones as you go along, which is these spots right there. Uh, you can put up to two ammo behind you, so rolling three total. So out of three, can I get him? Yes. <laughs> it's actually a thing where you roll three dice and you don't know if you're going to kill a zombie. doesn't always happen. Uh, so you can also roll this symbol, which pushes them back. So if they were in my face like that, then and if I got two of those, then I can push them back uh, pretty good, which is exactly what I want. Uh, you know, standard fare. If you're next to a door, you can flip the door. Uh, if you go in here then uh, this symbol right there means that you would trigger some kind of event so you won't know who is in a room. Uh, you would roll a die, uh, this die right here, and it would, there'll be a table. And there could be zombies in here, there could be corpses uh, that would resurrect later. So uh, very much playing into, you don't know what you're getting, that horror feel, as opposed to more of a straight up dungeon crawler. So let's say you're going into the door and you roll on that snazzy table and you get zombies. <laughs> Uh, the zombies will spawn on the spawn points. Uh, once again, you can get other things too. Uh, but as an example, you would get zombies. Uh, so uh, they generally don't do anything on your turn unless you are in their square monkeying with them. So then if I attack and I fail to kill it, then it would get an attack back at me and I would have a chance to dodge. Uh, dodging is fairly easy if it's a small number of zombies, but if there are up to three or if there's a bigger zombie there, then it would be a little bit harder to dodge. You would have to get the best success. Uh, either way, uh, try not to do things in the same square as the zombies. <laughs> it does have a mechanism where if you do successfully dodge and the zombie is still there, after your attack, you can kind of push them away. 
Uh, so that might be a good way to get the zombies out of your hair or push them where you want to go. As you make attacks, the other zombies on the hallway will respond or link tiles. So then let's say I had made that attack. Oh, who's going on over there? Blah, brains. <laughs> there you go. Uh, for the most part, uh, in, especially in the early game, but in a later game as well, take advantage of those doors. So then if I wanted to go like this and close the door, then these zombies would be out of luck and I wouldn't hear from them. So the zombies have some chances to interact with you during your turn. After your turn, they do get a separate activation. Uh, if this one was next to me, it would attack and I would get my dodge uh, opportunity. If it was apart from me, then it would move one square towards me and then it, a play would move. Very, very quick and easy, the AI for the enemies. The last phase of the turn is the tension deck. Uh, so most of the tension deck are, are these all clear cards. So then uh, trying to build the tension. So it's like, okay, what's going to happen? All clear. What's going to happen? All clear. What's going to happen? Dead rising. Ah! <laughs> or something worse. Uh, so these, this will be pretty full of all clears at the beginning of the campaign. But as you go through scenario, scenario, you will add worse and worse cards. Uh, and the cards that you do add will get worse depending on what symbol is on there. So those are your turns. You're going to go and then the enemy phase and then the tension phase. Uh, those three will cycle around as you move through the entire area. Uh, these red lines denote walls, so you're going to have to go through the doors and everything. Uh, most part, you're going to, to search these items. A are very basic items. B are scenario specific. Uh, C is what you are looking for. C is generally an item that is relevant to progress uh, in the campaign or maybe even in the scenario. So like maybe while well, in one of these places, uh, in this example B, uh, you would find a key that you would unlock the door and you would also unlock this additional piece of map over there. So uh, this game, Resident Evil 3, wants to keep you moving and moving and moving. Uh, the games are satisfying in and of themselves, but they want you to keep constantly look forward to the next scenario, the next thing, the next challenge. And so here is the scenario. Uh, this is the terror level that I mentioned in reference to the tension deck. So as I showed you, uh, there is going to be these symbols right over here. Uh, they correspond to this track. So then the higher the uh, terror level goes, and it only goes up. <laughs> and this is over the course of multiple scenarios. So not only are you adding worse and worse cards to the tension deck, uh, they are going to get worse depending on how horrible things are in Raccoon City. The game uh, starts, the campaign starts with three unlocked scenarios. I have um, laid out the uptown scenario uh, here in this demonstration. But as I uncover C decks and other uh, tokens, I will remove different areas uh, that will be discovered. Uh, that will be, you know, you kind of just move through and eventually you are going to get to the clock tower, uh, which uh, veteran Resident Evil fans are going to know all about that. <laughs> Before I move on, a very quick note about the componentry and the uh, carrying case for the retail version. So then they have this cover, and I put my cards and bags, and it has room for some of the tokens and some of the uh, other components right there. But if I put that back, uh, then I have not a lot of room for, or I mean, I have room for the tiles, but they're just going to be kind of sliding around a little bit. Uh, this is not uh, optimal um, storage, so I just wanted to let everybody know about that. So that was Resident Evil 3 at the table. Full disclosure, I have zero familiarity with the original IP. Never played the video game. Uh, I, it, a little too gory for me, uh, a little too in-your-face, uh, especially with the video game uh, model. But in the board game, even though there are you know violent images and everything, uh, it felt a little bit more of a distance. You know, It wasn't just like the gore in my face. Uh, it was able to kind of put me in a general space that I'm familiar with, you know, Night of the Living Dead and Walking Dead, all kind of stuff. I just kind of pretend that I was there uh, and it made no difference whether I was a video game fan or not. I was playing a survival horror game. And let me talk about the best parts first. Theme really well realized, uh, you know, just so much that uh, evokes the theme, not just in terms of its vibe and its aesthetic and everything, but mechanically. The die, that one die, that 1d6 <laughs> with one success on it just said so much, just opening the box. Uh, and I'm checking out the dice and I'm going, oh, 
okay, this was uh, now this is what I have to do. You know, as a very very old school D and D player, where you know heroes were weak, and you know uh, you had to kind of duck and move. You couldn't just come in and, and thrash everything. This was a nice throwback vibe, but with modern mechanisms. So it was a good marriage of the two. Also, uh, the game did a lot in terms of keeping things snappy and quick, uh, especially in the in-between phases. Not a lot of complex activation for the monster. Even when you get into, you know, further down the road where the monsters get a little bit more complicated, it's not that bad. It just, you just fast, fast, fast. You know, you have your enemy turn, you do the tension deck, one card, mostly all clear, but sometimes, ah, in your face. And even those tend to be pretty, um quick to kind of figure out what to do and then go 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 i finished a solo uh, scenario one player uh, about 20 minutes especially the beginning scenarios i could just go you know, boom done 20 minutes 10 minutes to switch it out boom 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 uh finished a lot of the scenario i think i played like five or six of them in one sitting because i just kept i, I had that you know impulse that forward momentum the way that the scenarios are built you know you find one thing you put it on the scenario tracker you set it up and you go through boom, 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 boom. uh i imagine it would take a little bit longer in a multiplayer scenario but you're not looking at one and a half hours two hours per scenario at the higher player counts it's really really quick and a lot of that is how simple to run and still engaging the ai is the advantage being zombies, they're not that complicated, but they've managed to pull that off. So much thematically, mechanically worked to create a vibe. This game felt right. All right, so let me get into some difficulties that I had. Uh, first of all, the componentry for the retail version made me want the Kickstarter. Uh, especially the doors. Uh, the doors are such a huge part of this game and having the plastics, whether they're open or uh, closed and having that be something that I could see visually quickly would have been really welcome. What I had was the tiles, uh, very dark tiles. And, you know, because of the way the game works, depending on where the zombies are, uh, when you attack something, the zombies re react and move. When you, uh, during turns, the zombies move. And you're looking at it. Is that an open door? Is that a closed door? Is that a, a barricade? And constantly looking at and not having that immediate um, thing just in your face. Okay, this is what's happening. Kind of took me out of the flow a little bit. Uh, I, I, you know, I kind of would have wanted just bright colors. Uh, if for a component that important or brighter colors, a different approach might have been really helpful. And I showed the box uh, in terms of uh, also componentry on the retail edition, the box. Uh, uh, check that out for yourself. In terms of the flow of the scenarios, it's a mix for me. The negative part is that I don't know that the scenarios felt different, uh, hugely different from, you know, one to one. So, you know, you would, you know, one scenario would have you, you know, go in, barricade a door, go at, go over here, uh, find a thing, go over here, find this other thing. The, they reshape the tiles. So like you, theoretically it's, uh, it, it's different. Uh, but uh, underneath in terms of mechanical experience, it's like, all right, what, where am I going to go? What am I going to find? Move on. A lot of the scenarios were like that. The big difference in the scenarios is the amping up of the monsters. More things can kill you. There are more things on the board to track uh, and, you know, that are coming at you. You get better weaponry. Uh, so you the game turns into a firefight uh, towards the end. It becomes that more familiar dungeon crawly-esque experience. Only not really because uh, it's not like a zombicide. A zombicide is just a huge romp. You know, you're always hitting and it's just like, how many zombies can I mow down? I would rather have this than a zombicide. Very much so. This is much more my speed in terms of a vibe. However, it definitely leaned a little bit closer to that end of things. More closer than I would have wanted as a survival person. Uh, I would have hoped, like, as, as these scenarios went on, there would be more environment stuff to do. I didn't show this, uh, but uh, one of the things that you could do is like there's barrels, and if you want to shoot the barrel, it's full of oil that just sh uh, blows up, and the zombies do. Uh, so I would have loved to have more tools in that perspective. Uh, you know, set up my own barrels, uh, find distracting materials, have a, a big T-bone steak. It's like a video game, right? So whatever. T-bone steak, throw it down the thing, a zombie goes chasing it. Uh, <laughs> you probably don't do that in a video game, <laughs> but something like that to maintain that sense of survival as opposed to kind of transforming into what is a 
mediocre mechanically combat experience um, because I just don't, I didn't feel like I was, I had a lot of tactical options for killing monsters towards the uh, middle and end. Having said that though, it's good. You know, it's still thrilling. Uh, it's, it's still well delivered ultimately at the end of the day. Uh, and the cinematic sense of it uh, kept on going up for me. I was invested in the story. I was in, I was uh, affected by the events and like there was global events that persist from game to game. Uh, I got into that. So, you know, that it wasn't uh, the height of my uh, experiences, but it also wasn't just like an empty candy uh, experience either. It's kind of like right in the middle. And to me, I thought that was uh, ultimately a satisfying experience. So we're going to go 7.5 here, seal of approval, for Resident Evil 3, the board game. If you can change your mind, it can change the world, people. So until next time, later, everybody. Yeah.